Hey there, today on the final bar, we're gonna do something a little different. We have to record this earlier in the week. So what we wanted to do is take a step back and look in particular at breadth measures. A big part of my thesis going into the market top in uh, February and also the uh, move into the beginning of September was weakening breadth conditions. So we're gonna look at what breadth means, different ways we can measure it, and what it's telling us about the market right now. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. This is Dave Keller here at stockcharts.com in Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close to look at these markets together, break down the conditions using the lenses of technical analysis, behavioral finance, all the other tools that we can bring to bear. We have to record this a little earlier in the week because uh, I'm speaking today at uh, Babson College in, uh, in Boston. Uh, virtually, of course, unfortunately, we couldn't get there, uh, you know, in person, but doing a day's worth of, uh, of virtual lectures for, uh, for some of the students there and hopefully uh, educating them and inspiring them to dig into market momentum, price behavior, investor decision making, all those things that we refer to regularly on, uh, on the final bar. What we wanted to do today, though, is dig in a little deeper into breadth conditions, because uh, breadth is a big part of my process. As we've talked about many times on the show, my macro thesis usually has three main parts. It starts with price, and then breadth, and then sentiment, and it's in priority order right there. So the main thing, if you ask me to uh, you know, give an assessment of the S&P 500, my first thing I would look at would be a chart of the S&P 500, because I think that's the best way of understanding all those things we talk about. You want to know what investors are thinking, how they're positioned, what they're nervous about, excited about. The price reflects all that, or at least that is the thesis of technical analysis and behavioral finance, right? The price uh, has memory and the price illustrates or quantifies that investor behavior. Um, second to that, though, and, and the question is, when you understand the price and once you've determined the trend and you're following the trend, but what next, right? What are the signals you can look for to try to validate or invalidate or qualify or disqualify what you're seeing with price? Because the questions you're trying to answer are where are the trends? How can I follow the trends? And then when am I, am I anticipating a trend reversal or a trend exhaustion? And I think Brett does a really good job of helping you determine when to lean into trends and when to maybe start to tap the brakes or take profits or lean away from the trends if you're starting to see signals of internal weakness. So what we're gonna to do today is talk a little bit about market breadth, what it is, what it is and then we're gonna to get to the charts and look at a lot of examples of breadth conditions and, uh, and what they've told us about market peaks so far in 2020, and then what, they, uh, what they're telling us about the overall market right about now. So first off, what is breadth? The way I think about breadth is breadth is participation, meaning if the price of the S&P 500 or whatever index you're looking at tells you the overall value of that index or where it's trading, where it's moving, um, you know, Brett tells you participation. It says, all right, the S&P 500 is made up of 500 individual listings. So what are those 500 stocks doing? And then what you do is you look at the price of the index and you look at the, uh, the chart of the, uh, of the uh, breadth indicator and you're able to qualify what the price is doing. Uh, if the price is moving higher and the breadth is improving as well, that's uh, you know, confirming, uh, the breadth is confirming uh, the, the uptrend in, in, the, in the market. If the price is going down and the breadth is going down as well, making new lows, that also is confirming one another. The real signal though, I think the real information is when you get a disagreement, when you get a divergence. Price moving higher, but breadth rolling over is one indication. Breadth, uh, price going lower and breadth starting to rotate higher, right? when there's a disagreement between the two. And the general idea is that while price is what you need to follow because that's what you get paid on. You don't get paid on a breadth measure, you're getting paid on the, the price of the asset that you're looking at. But breadth will start to tell you when the conditions are changing. And in my opinion, in an uptrend, weakening breadth tells you when to start looking for, you know, determining your risk assessment and, and determining when you need to exit a long position if and when the market does roll over. If the market's going lower and you start to see breadth improving, it tells you not necessarily to buy today, but to look for signals of trend reversals and sort of put it on your watch list of potential signals to be aware of. 
So that's what breadth is. It's really about participation. There are a lot of different ways to do it. And it's things we talk about often, especially in financial media, things like the cumulative advanced decline lines, things about things like uh, stocks above or below their moving averages, um, the McClellan oscillator, the bullish percent index, new highs and new lows, volume, on balance volume. These are all different measures of breadth characteristics. So what we're going to do, let's get to the charts and we're actually going to look at um, a bunch of charts together. We're going to start with the breadth indicator uh, chart list that I created a, a while ago. This is something you can actually access right through stockcharts.com. So if you go to your dashboard, uh, which we'll do here momentarily, if you go to your dashboard, uh, if you go to the right side, you'll see chart lists. This is going to list your chart list. We, we may have very different lists and that's totally fine. At the very bottom of that list, you're gonna see a, a little gray button. Sorry, I have a lot of chart lists we're flipping through. It's called Manage Chart Packs. This is gonna list all the different uh, expert strategists, analysts, uh, traders on stockcharts.com that have given a chart pack. And all you need to do is hit install next to David Keller's morning coffee routine chart pack. I'd encourage you to experiment with the uh, and, and, and learn about some of these other ones as well for sure. But this one in particular is going to uh, include the chart list that we're talking about. Basically, it'll install 15 different chart lists into your, uh, into your uh, login. You'll, they'll appear on your uh, dashboard and you'll be able to follow along exactly with the charts that we're looking at uh, today. So if you haven't done that before, I would go ahead and do that now before we get started because as we go along, we'll be able to, to, uh, you'll be able to save your own thoughts and, uh, and analyze them right into your, uh, into your own login. So this is a list. We're going to go through some of these charts. We don't have time to go through all of them, but I did want to start to walk through. And as we do, we'll talk about some of the characteristics of, uh, of different market phases. We're going to start with one of the more standard ways to measure um, breadth, in my opinion, which is looking at stocks relative to their moving averages. If you look at a stock like Apple, right, it has uh, two moving averages that I usually refer to on my charts, the 50-day moving average and the 200-day moving average. And in general, an uptrend for me, all else being equal in a vacuum, an uptrend is the price is above two upward sloping moving averages. So it's the price, then the 50 day, then the 200 day moving average. If you look at, um, let's see what's something that might be below some moving averages. Here we have ConocoPhillips and we can see that the price is below the 50 day moving average and below the 200 day moving average. So what you are doing with this breadth indicator is you're basically saying how many stocks look like Apple, how many stocks look like ConocoPhillips, and you're measuring that uh, using the percent of uh, stocks within the benchmark that are above their 200-day or below their 200-day moving average. So here, we're looking at uh, quite a bit of data. This is the, um, uh, the S&P 500 going back to 2003, that, uh, that sort of secondary low in March of 03 before the rally into the 2007 high. So I'm bringing in a lot of data just to get a good long-term perspective and to show what this indicator does during bear market cycles, which I thought was important. So here in green, we're looking at the percent of stocks on the New York Stock Exchange above their 200-day moving average. On the bottom, the percent of stocks in the S&P 500 above their 200-day moving average. So right now, as the, at the time we're recording this, the absolute value here is 64%. So 64% of the NYSE above their 200-day, 75% uh, of the S&P above their 200-day. Now, why are these different and why am I looking at the two of them together? This is one of the ways you can start to compare large cap versus other cap tiers. So how are the largest companies doing relative to some of the other companies? The S&P 500 are 500 relatively large cap, uh, me, you know, mega cap types of stocks. These are the largest names essentially in the uh, traded in the U.S. So big blue chip companies, you know, big cap tech and communication services and all, you know, most sectors represented in some, uh, you know, uh, in some way for sure. Uh, but it's a, you know, generally leaning more of the large cap part of the U.S. equity space. This one, the NYSE uh, percent above their 200-day New York Stock Exchange, a couple thousand stocks, and it's not just large caps, also mid and small cap in there too. These are equal weighted measures because it's simply a percent of how many stocks are above or below their moving average. So all stocks treated equally, and it's showing you the percent above or below. So right now, there are more stocks in the S&P above their 200-day than the NYSE above their 200 day. And that's because some of the larger companies are the ones that have really been driving uh, higher while some of the mid cap, small cap stocks uh, are, have not recovered and gone back above their 200 day moving average. That's really what you're sort of seeing here. But overall, most stocks uh, by whatever universe you're looking at are above their 200 day moving average. If you look back at historical bull market cycles, so if you look here, mid-2009, early 2011, even back here in early 2007, which was 
you know, six to eight months before the eventual market peak, you can see that often this indicator will get above 80%, even up to 90%, which is where it was here in mid-2009 coming out of the, uh, the market low in, uh, in the first quarter of 2009. So uh, the point, and if you look at the S&P 500, we reached, I mean, 90 plus percent, 95 percent at times, I think is usually the, the peak uh, where, where stocks are above. And this is not a topping signal. If you look here in 2013, 95 percent of stocks being above the S&P, excuse me, members of the S&P 500 being above their 200 day moving average was not a sell signal. It was actually telling you the strength, the broad strength of the, uh, of the increase in the market, you know, went higher another two years before this sort of cyclical bear in, uh, in 15 and 16. And, and obviously overall, the, the market has been incredibly strong. So I think a lot of people oversimplify. And when they see this indicator get above 80%, get above 85, 90%, whatever the thing is, they say, well, the market's overextended. It's not like RSI in that way. Um, in that um, thing, and, and RSI, to be honest, is, is like this as well. Just because it's at an extreme high level does not mean that it can't remain elevated for quite a long period of time. And I think that's an important uh, thing to note. So here in early 2020, we're gonna get to the next chart that really focuses on that period. But here I just wanted to show you the long-term trajectory and show you that in big downtrends, this indicator can get near, at or near zero. In big uptrends, it can become uh, you know, at or near 100%. Uh, and so right now we're at 75% of the S&P above their 200-day. Uh, this next chart gets a little more granular. This is just looking at the last two years. And we're looking at the um, S&P 500 here at the top. We're looking at the percent above their 200-day and the percent of S&P members above their 50-day moving average. So uh, now looking at the same universe with two different moving averages. So what's interesting when you look at the market peak uh, here in, uh, in early 2020, this is one of the many indications that I felt suggested weakening breadth conditions. Uh, and we're going to look at another one here uh, in a few moments. So if you look here at the peak in January and the fact that uh, about 88, 87, 88 percent of the S&P above their 200 day moving average, the market then pulled back and moved to a subsequent peak there in February. And you can see that it's uh, just under about 80 percent, really. Um, so so many less companies. Uh, you know, broke down below their 200 day on this pullback and did not get back above it. So what that usually means when you have the price rallying and the breadth conditions going down uh, is that the, the conditions are weakening sort of under the hood. It's sort of that second level, right? So the price is going higher, but the breadth is going lower. And what that suggests is less and less companies participating in the upside. So that divergence, what I call a breadth divergence, which is higher highs in price, Lower peaks in the percent of stocks uh, going above their moving averages just tells you less companies participating in the upside speaks to a bit of internal weakness that there's already profit taking that even though the index is going higher, it's probably a smaller number of large defensive stocks that are propelling the index e even further and, and, and some stocks are already starting to, uh, to break down. So that is one of the real key signals you could be looking for. Uh, when the market gets uh, elevated. And I think that's one of the things you want to start looking for now as we, you know, test all time highs just below 3,600 is if and when you get price and breadth divergence, that would suggest uh, a bit of a, of a uh, you know, higher potential for a top. As the, uh, the market sold off, you can see that the, both of these indicators went very, very low and actually it was 0%, a hundred percent of the, the S and P 500 below their 50 day moving average going into the market low uh, in March. So where are we at now in, the, in this, uh, using this indicator? Well, again, as we mentioned on the previous chart, 75% of the S&P above their 200 day. Um, you know, overall, you can see this pink line here at 50%. That's the main way that I use this. Uh, besides divergences, the other main way is just, is it above or below 50%? Because if you look back over longer period of times, bull market cycles, like here in 2019, you tend to get above 50% and remain above 50%. When the market pulls back, Half of stocks still remain above their 200-day moving average. That's pretty important. You know, if and when we break through that, like we did here at the, uh, at the end of February, that tells you conditions are definitely changing. It's weaker rather than stronger. A lot of stocks breaking down, and that's cause for uh, concern, meaning the potential for going materially lower has definitely increased. So, you know, right now, if and when we would pull back, and I, this is something I was certainly looking at here, in mid to late September, when the market came off the September high, pulled down into that 3,200 to 3,250 range, which ended up being a beautiful support level. You know, I was very focused on this to see if it remained above 50%. It did, which for me was one of the data points suggesting this was just a short-term 
uh, correction within a longer term uptrend. If and when we break down through 50%, that I think would validate a much stronger potential for further downside. Here we're looking at the percent above their 50 day moving average. And I think most recently, the fact that this whipped back above and went back above the 50% level here in uh, late September certainly suggested to me that in the short term, many stocks starting to recover uh, their 50 day, just like the S&P was trying to do and, uh, and starting to, uh, to improve. So overall, these are ways of measuring uh, the individual names. You see where the S&P is relative to its 50 day and 200 day. Individual stocks can be doing something a little different. And this indicator in particular sort of tells you those, uh, those differences. Now, another main way to look at market breadth is using advanced decline lines. This is a common way we refer to uh, market strength or market weakness, because what it does is it tells you day to day how many stocks are closing higher or lower on the day. Now, here we're running at midday uh, uh, on an average day right now. Uh, you know, the market overall has been coming off of the late September uh, lows. Uh, the, this short, sort of short term uh, pullback, uh, it's now recovered back and heading uh, higher. Today, though, you know, the price is down a little bit and you can see that 70, 69 percent of the S&P down today. Uh, and sorry, this is not the S&P 500. It's actually the New York Stock Exchange. This is the number of stocks declining today on the NYSE as a, as a percentage of the overall total number of names. Here we're looking at stocks up versus the total number. So 30% of the New York Stock Exchange up as of this moment, I'm, I'm recording the video, 69% today. But if you look back, you can see daily readings of advanced or decliners. So obviously this is not a good long-term measure because it's taking day-to-day -day snapshots. It's really telling you about the characteristics of particular uh, trading days. What you'll notice is in distribution phases, when the market's going lower, you will see clusters of what we call 90% down days. This is where at least 90% of the New York Stock Exchange closing lower than yesterday. That means nine stocks in 10 going down. That is a big push in one direction. That is a singular focus for the equity, uh, for the equity space. It's not just a handful of names selling off. It's most names, if not almost all of them. So you can see here on the big down days during that sell-off from February to March, you saw times when almost 100% of the New York Stock Exchange was down, which is incredibly rare, but we got pretty close. Once the market bottomed out and you could start to see improvements coming out of the lows, you can see many fewer 90% down days and, uh, and, a, and a handful of 90% up days, which tells you obviously the opposite. At least 90% of the uh, equity market going higher in, in terms of this universe, it's pretty encouraging. So. Right now, what's happened is you really haven't had much of either. You had just barely, and it was not quite a 90% down day here in late September. This is when we were getting uh, sort of in this period. Overall, if the market starts selling off, I would be glancing at this chart to see if we get a cluster of 90% down days, because that tells you that the characteristics are similar to what we saw here in February and March, which was a weaker environment, which was a broad sell-off, uh, which told you that uh, even if price was holding up, Overall, the, the down days were much stronger than the, uh, than the up days. The opposite, if the market gets to 3,600, starts pushing above and you get 90% up days, that speaks to market strengths, that speaks, speaks to internal strength, that speaks to many stocks closing higher versus, uh, versus lower and should uh, you know, make you feel better about uh, the potential for further upside. What we've seen recently is really neither. It's been more of a choppy sideways tape. If you look over the last... Uh, you know, six weeks. We really haven't gone anywhere. We, I mean, we have. We've gone up and down, but overall, directionally, the trend has sort of stalled uh, since the move into the September peak. If and when we break above 3,600, that's where I think this chart will become uh, become pretty key. Now we're looking at new highs and new lows. This is an, actually, you know what? I'm going to switch and, and show this one. Yeah, we'll come back to that last one. This one is looking at that previous chart we looked at advancers, decliners, and now we're actually gonna do it on a cumulative measure. So that last chart was showing you day to day, how many stocks closing higher, how many stocks closing lower. Here we're actually looking at a cumulative measure. So overall, are stocks closing uh, higher or lower over a series of days? So every day, if uh, you know, stocks, uh, you know, if the uh, uh, number of stocks uh, is more advancers than decliners, you add that amount to the cumulative total. If it's more decliners than advancers, you subtract this from the cumulative total. And overall, you have the net amount over time of stocks closing higher or lower. And so the real key to this, and it tends to have a pretty positive, strong correlation over time. Um, you're looking at the movement in the price. This is the S&P at the top. And right here, we're looking at the percent of uh, advancers decline, or sorry, the number of advancers decliners in the New York Stock Exchange. So the same universe we were looking at on the previous chart. 
overall, when the market's going higher, you would expect this line to be trending higher as well because you will have more up days than down days, more stocks closing higher than lower. And as a result, it will confirm one another. In a down tape, you would expect this line to go down uh, where there's uh, you know more stocks declining than advancing day to day over time. The real signal is a couple things. Number one, are they confirming one another? Number two, are there disagreements? And I think that's where uh, this indicator can be very, very valuable. So two signals we've had over the last year, I think suggested market topping conditions and, and served uh, pretty well. Here in January to February, you can see the peak in January, the higher high here in February, this is really a higher close. But if you look at the percent of stocks uh, advancing, advancers versus decliners in the New York Stock Exchange, you can see lower peaks over that period. So the second peak here, which was higher in price, was actually lower using this measure. It's similar to the percent of stocks above the 200 day. It had a very similar pattern there. What that told you is internal weakness, right? So as the price was going higher, less and less stocks closing higher on the average days, which meant during these down days, you were starting to get heavier distribution than on the up days. And so that means, or that suggests some internal weakness. So when the price broke down, it really validated that uh, bearish divergence. You saw actually a very similar pattern here in early September, where you saw the highs from August to September, obviously accelerating as the S&P neared 3,600. And you can see that the, the advancer decliners actually was sloping downwards going into that early September high. So for me, that was one of the things suggesting we were at an exhaustion point, had gone too far, and that stocks were starting to, uh, to disagree with that, uh, with that trend. So that is one of the ways. So right now, uh, what's interesting is this breadth indicator has gone above its August peak, meaning uh, you know uh, the advanced decline line is confirming higher highs. It's actually pushing to uh, to new swing highs above the uh, the peak from uh, early August, and suggesting uh, that the uptrend is in uh, is in decent shape from a breadth perspective. Now I also have three other lines on here, and this is the cumulative advanced decline line for the New York Stock Exchange. Then we have the S and P 500. Then we have the S&P mid cap index, and then finally the S&P small cap index. So now what we're doing is looking at the major cap tiers, large, mid, and small, and seeing what the indications are telling us about those. So what's interesting is if you look at the 2020 uh, January, February peak, you can see this is that bearish divergence we were talking about. You can see the same pattern in the mid cap uh, breadth indicator and the small cap breadth indicator, but look at the large cap breadth actually disagreed. It actually went to higher peaks. The very same thing happened here in August and September. Uh, you know, the S&P breadth line increased as the S&P went to new highs in early September, but the New York Stock Exchange, the mid cap and the small cap breadth lines all sloped downwards. That is a really classic sign of a market top where you have a small number, a relatively small number of large mega cap stocks continuing to push higher while the average stocks have actually rolled downwards. And so what happens there, uh, that divergence, both of these times is sort of a classic bull market topping pattern. That's what, for me, sort of validated the, uh, the danger of potential downside. Now, what has happened is the S&P pulled down to around 3,200 to 3,250, has now gone back higher, and we'll see if it's able to you know, eclipse the previous highs and break the 3,600 level. I'm not sure if that's gonna happen, but I do know that one thing to watch would be these breadth lines. Whether these breadth lines are able to confirm new highs will be very, uh, very key. As the S&P moves higher, if you get any sort of negative divergence from these lines, that would be key as well. And so that's why this chart is one of the more common ones that I refer to. And it's on my Mindful Investor Live chart list that we use on the show pretty often. The next one is this one, which is the uh, stocks making new highs and new lows for the last 52 weeks. And it's doing it on the New, uh, new York Stock Exchange here in the middle and then at the bottom, the S&P 500. I usually refer to this bottom uh, panel only because the S&P is a pretty broad, uh, you know, large caps uh, universe. And, and that's one of the main, you know, a, a, name, a list of stocks that most people know and are familiar with for the most part um, and, and pretty broad representation of the, uh, of the uh, economic conditions. So what's interesting about this one, and if you look back here in uh, middle of September, you can see as the S&P was pulling back and just started to rotate higher, you can see that there were very few new highs. And on an average day, it would be like five to 10 stocks in the S&P 500, which is a one to 2% of the S&P, that's a super tiny amount. So what happens as the S&P pulls back and is starting to go higher, what you would hope is that leadership names, groups like semiconductors, home builders, uh, hardware companies, you know, stocks that should be doing well in a bullish tape, you would hope that they are making new 52 week highs, even though the S&P has not quite done it yet, because it's got 500 companies with a lot of different, uh, you know, uh, sectors represented. 
here you're actually looking, uh, you know, to see if, uh, you know, if, if stocks are able to push above that all-time high, because my confidence that the S&P is going to eclipse 3,600 is going to be driven by a bunch of stocks already doing that before the S&P does, if that makes sense. So one of the things we were missing here in late September was an increasing number of new highs, meaning some members of the S&P, even though, even though the index was not doing it yet, some stocks within the index were starting to be able to make new 52-week highs, able to eclipse their January or February high, able to eclipse their early September, late August high, uh, their June high, whatever it was, and able to get to, uh, to a new 52-week uh, peak. What's interesting is in the first uh, couple of weeks in October, we've now seen that breadth expansion where more and more stocks making new 52 week highs. And at the peak, it was almost about 80 stocks. So you think about 15, 16% of the S&P 500 on a single day making a new 52 week high. To feel better about the potential for the market to go higher, I would want to see more of those new highs. And you started to see that expansion when it continues to see more. Well, more and more names, just like the S&P, able to get through a key resistance level that has been, uh, you know, obviously very important for individual stocks and for the market uh, so far in 2020. We're going to go quickly through a couple more charts because we're essentially at the end of our 30, uh, 30 minutes, but I did want to hit just a couple other examples. Bullish percent index is one of the things that we look at, and this is uh, essentially using point and figure charts. What you look at is uh, the point and figure charts in a universe. So here we're looking at the S&P 500 and what percent of them have had a bull signal, a buy signal versus a sell signal. And if you're not familiar with point and figure charts, it's a whole separate uh, special we can do some days, go through the nuances of that. But eventually it's, it's, it's quantifying how many stocks in the S&P are in an uptrend or a downtrend. We run these bullish percent indexes for broad indexes, but we also do them for sectors and for other uh, particular groups. So uh, on the market uh, summary page, you can actually see some of the different breadth uh, uh, bullish percent indexes that we track. Whether or not this is above 50% is one of the main key basic tenants. So if it, you know, if the market's going higher, this remaining above 50% is pretty key, especially during a pullback. We got below 50%, which is one of the signals that started to concern me and started to make me rely a lot on that 3,200 level for support because I was starting to see weakening breadth conditions. And, and unless those, that level holds, uh, you know, we, the potential to go down, there were all the conditions were there. It was right for further downside. It did not happen. We got back above 50% as the S&P gapped higher and continued to move higher. So on any sort of pullback, you look for a break below 50%, and that would be a potential area of concern. Now that we've gotten above 70%, that's one of the other signals as you look for when it comes out of that 70% range, which we saw here the first week in September. Uh, we saw even back here, uh, you know, some of these early pullbacks within the uptrend out of the March lows. So that would be one thing to, uh, and also here at the February peak, I should point out as well. So that's one thing to note, you see in a cyclical bull phase, breaking back below 70% is a bit of a warning signal for uh, bullish percents as well. The last thing I'm going to talk about is the McClellan Oscillator. So we talked about advancers, decliners, and one of the other ways we, uh, we measure that is looking at the McClellan Oscillator, which sim essentially takes uh, some exponential moving averages of advancers, decliners, tries to smooth out the noise a little bit. And just like with some of the other ones, you have a zero level right in the, uh, right in the middle. When this indicator is above zero, that tells you that it's stronger rather than weaker. Basically, the trend in advanced or decliners is positive. If the, uh, if the indicator is below zero, that tells you the trend conditions are more negative. And so you're really looking for where the, pri the, the indicator is relative to that zero line. When it broke below zero here in mid-August, this was one of the in information uh, points or data points going into the September peak that was a bit of a concern for me, for sure. The fact that we've broken back above the zero line here, the first, uh, you know, really the end of September into the first week in October, for me was one of the indications uh, that, uh, that things were uh, actually strengthening okay. So you can tell from the way that we've characterized some of these breadth indicators, they've rotated in many ways from, you know, conditions of weakness with bearish divergences on a lot of those cumulative advanced decline lines uh, going into the peak. Um, measures like uh, the McClellan oscillator going negative, uh, new highs evaporating, all those things suggested internal weakness. And, and what that tells me is to start to look for the conditions of a price peak. And we saw that as the S&P came off, as the S&P approached key res, uh, support level around 3,200. As the market started to improve again, you look for conditions improving in those breadth indicators, and that is what we've seen. And so overall, we can see breadth conditions have improved, overall very positive, now the question is, when do they turn negative? That is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us on The Final Bar. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.